the UK's Magnitsky sanctions. I just wonder what the three of you, what, what response the three of you would have um, to that. And perhaps, Bill, if you'd like to start and Nathan and James uh, to follow. <laughs> Well, um, so the Magnitsky Act um, in the UK is slightly different than the Canadian or, or American in that it just deals with human rights abuses. It doesn't deal with kleptocracy and corruption. But as far as Hong Kong is concerned, I don't think that that's really a problem. Um, uh, the level of evidence is is um, high. It requires, um, as as the foreign secretary said, you, they just don't do, you know, you can't just denounce someone and hope that they get sanctioned. And that's good that it's high because it keeps credibility with legislation. But I've watched videos uh, from Hong Kong showing um, massive violence against peaceful demonstrators. And um, th there are people who are committing the violence that are caught on tape. And there are people who have openly ordered the violence, um, the government of Hong Kong, um, who have responsibility. I don't think there's any mystery about this. and and Having been involved in, in the Magnitsky Act since its inception and seeing how it's been rolled out, um, I believe, and, and I think there's plenty of other um, specialists in this, uh, believe that the evidence is there um, and it reaches the threshold to sanction Carrie Lam and other officials in Hong Kong. And so I, I, I don't actually um, see this as, as being a, uh, a problem. Uh, and I think that that's, it can actually be done. Thank you. Um, Nathan, do you want to comment on this at this point? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I fully agree on the assessment um, from Bill. And I uh, also wanted to uh, really remind uh, our audience that um, UK signed a uh, standard British Line Declaration with the Chinese government in 1984, which um, it is responsible for overseeing the implementation of one country, two system and the current situation of Hong Kong, which uh, it, it, which uh, is from uh, 1997 to 2047. So um, theoretically speaking, uh, you, uh, the UK is actually uh, the most credible country to comment on Hong Kong issue and oblate to um, implementing measures in order to really make sure Hong Kong people, they are having what they had been promised, which is uh, democracy and autonomy. So I think uh, actually the UK government should really bear a uh, larger responsibility on that regards and take actions in a more proactive way in order to achieve that. So I, I think uh, the money cash should be implemented, uh, should be implemented on uh, the officials who are responsible for Hong Kong's erosion of autonomy and democracy. And the UK government should really do more in order to show their commitment in safeguarding the dignity uh, in of, of the treaty and um, following the obligation uh, when they are part of uh, the signature in in the treaty. Thank you, Nathan. Um, James, too. Well, Ben, you know, I, I think that, you know, in, in, from a Canadian context, we, we're caught in kind of a, 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 a strange situation where we have Canadians right now that have been wrongfully imprisoned for almost 800 days now in Chinese prisons. And so Michael Korverg and, and Michael Spaver, who are being held essentially because we have uh, Ms. Uh, Meijong uh, Wing, who is the Chief Financial Officer of Huawei, has been held under house arrest here in, in Canada facing extradition orders uh, to the United States, and she's going through the legal process. So we have a situation of hostage diplomacy taking place between China and, and, and Canada, and that has somewhat tripped up the Canadian government in applying sanctions to those responsible, as, as, as Bill pointed out, the police protection that we're seeing on the streets against the university protesters who were out there peacefully just standing up for, for democracy. And so I think we need to be following the United States lead on this. And so you do have, you know, uh, the commissioner of the Hong Kong police force, you know, Tang and the former commissioner Lo, who should be held to account for that, that police brutality as well as all those that carried out th those orders. And it's often that the disease, the second and third tier officials who have the greatest cost when they are sanctioned under Meninsky laws. And so uh, because they already have family and assets uh, that are outside of the uh, precinct of, of Hong Kong. So, you know, we need to
all different levels are being sanctioned through Magnitsky and the US uh, ha has started the way and Hong Kong Watch has made a suggestion of a long list of individuals who are responsible for the violence in, in, in Hong Kong and that those in individuals need to be sanctioned now. Absolutely. Th thank you. Very much. Um, it's a really uh, great uh, pleasure to, to welcome Alistair Carmichael, um, who has very kindly stepped in at uh, quite short notice to, to uh, contribute uh, to this. Um, Alistair Carmichael is the uh, Member of Parliament for uh, Orkney and Shetland, which, if I'm correct, is the northernmost constituency in the entire United Kingdom. Um, he is the Liberal Democrats uh, spokesman on home affairs and was previously uh, their foreign affairs uh, spokesman. Um, he, in the past, was uh, his party's chief whip. Um, uh, in the coalition government, he served in cabinet as the Secretary of State for Scotland. He's the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Hong Kong and also on the Uyghurs. Um, and from our point of view, most importantly, he is a patron of Hong Kong Watch and uh, one of our uh, most uh, um, active uh, allies and friends uh, in Parliament. Um, and in fact, uh, Alistair, I think just a week or so ago, you spoke uh, on the issue of Magnitsky sanctions in the House of Commons, and you had that wonderful line uh, that the government's excuse for not uh, implementing them yet is that they don't want to give a heads up to Hong Kong officials, and you said you rather thought we had already lost the element of surprise and there was therefore no reason to delay further, um, which I very much agree with. So, Alistair, thank you so much for joining us and um, please, uh, over to you. How long are you wanting me to speak for? To be honest? Um, ab about five minutes or so, but if it's a couple of minutes more than that, that's no problem. Yeah. No, no, Luke, that's ideal. Um, so, listen, thank you for the invitation, and uh, let me just say, actually, thank you to Hong Kong Watch, you know, uh, as um, an organisation that manages to keep Hong Kong front and centre um, of our uh, political life and our media attention. Uh, the work they do is absolutely uh, phenomenal, and I am enormously a privileged, I feel, to be to be a patron of Hong Kong Watch. So, um, if I get a, a a request to do anything for the organisation, then um, I always feel that it's an obligation in me to do it if it is at all humanly possible. So it's a, a genuine pleasure, not just a politician's pleasure, but a genuine pleasure to be uh, with you all here this afternoon. Um, Ben's actually stolen the line that I was going to use, and it was wine that I. Uh, did use last week in the House of Commons because Nigel Adams, who's a you know good and thoughtful minister who has the responsibility for uh, Hong Kong, um, had been at the dispatch box. Now I am no cricketer; you'll maybe work that out from my accent. Um, but uh, it was, I, I think, the expression that you, know, you send the batsman into the. The, the, the wicket and just tell him to play it with a straight bat and that's what he was doing and you know if you read the Hansard of that exchange you will see a, a succession of very well delivered very clear very logical um, a, a, a policy positions uh, all good reasons why this is not quite the right time uh, so, an intellectually very well constructed argument, unless and until you put it into the context of the real world politics that we uh, and indeed people in Hong Kong have been living for years now. Um, and that's a situation which has been on a long, slow burn and which now with the implementation of the uh, national security law and the court appearances yesterday with the guilty pleas uh, under that, you realise actually that the, um, the, 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 the political context here is one that renders the very well-reasoned and cleverly constructed uh, reasons for not yet moving on Magnitsky sanctions uh, to be a quite ridiculous proposition. You know, the idea 
that somehow or another um, there is going to be uh, a, 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 an element of surprise in moving on Magnitsky's uh, sanctions it is frankly one which holds no uh, credibility at all. And this is where, um, for, for me, the uh, intellectual arguments do become very uh, compelling because um, I am, as I like to put it, a recovering lawyer turned politician. And that point of interface where law ends and politics begins is always a fascinating one. It's one where you do have to be very careful as a politician. So, you know, when there is a live court case, that's why we have, for example, in the House of Commons, a subjudice rule that it's not discussed. Um, and as a politician, you shouldn't be doing or saying anything that is going to prejudice in some way or another a future uh, or even live court action or legal proceedings of any sort. Um, but at the same time, what we have at the moment is a, a situation where the political uh, importance and the political uh, significance of, of, of the government talking directly about named individuals in the way that the rest of us all do, being subject for uh, Magnitsky sanctions, either in relation to Hong Kong or Xinjiang province or Tibet, um, I think would be absolutely phenomenal. So why does it not happen? Now, I'm no criminologist uh, on the current government, but I am told that there is something of an arm wrestle going on inside the, uh, the, the, the government. Um, there are still a significant number of um, political interests and business interests that are telling the government, tone it down, calm it down, you really don't want to be doing something to upset China in this way, which I think is a misreading of the situation because I think uh, the, the politics of how we engage with China has changed beyond recognition in the last 12 months. And I do give substantial credit to Dominic Raab as Foreign Secretary for having led that change. But that arm wrestle is still going on. So how do we shift this? Um, it's doing what you guys at Hong Kong Watch do better than anyone. We campaign. We talk about it. We lobby for it. We, f we push for engagement. And we would never take no for an answer. Because um, if you look at this in the old-fashioned terms of being a contest, con contest between uh, sort of monoliths on the world stage. You've got uh, America, you've got Britain, or you've got Europe, and you've got China. Um, then, you know, the, the opportunities for making progress here are much, uh, are, are much less uh, significant. Whereas, uh, if you look at it, uh, if you put Magnitsky sanctions into the mix, then it's another string to the bow, which could be the thing that eventually unlocks progress. And let me just say, finally, um, people will tell you that you shouldn't do this for commercial reasons. Um, people will tell you that, you know, China's a sovereign nation and that she should be allowed just to run her affairs as she chooses to and that, you know, we should get off our uh, imperialist or neo-imperialist stick and uh, let them to get on with it. For people uh, of my generation, I was born in 1965. I cut my political teeth in the 1980s. At the time of the anti-apartheid movement and uh, when the Cold War in Europe very much dominated the, uh, the, the, the foreign affairs agenda uh, of this country and others, so let me tell you, these are all the arguments that I used to be told about uh, apartheid and South Africa. And we felt every day that we were trying to push water up a hill and that we were never making any progress on it. And that was the way it felt right up until the day when suddenly it flipped and it changed. And then before you knew it, you had Nelson Mandela walking out of, of prison and 
you had free and fair elections and you had an ANC government. Um, that's how change happens. You, you, so it doesn't just happen, you have to make it happen, you have to campaign for it to happen. And it's sometimes when you are campaigning feels as if you're never going to see any progress on anything. And sometimes progress when it comes, as Ben and I know from our engagement in Burma in years gone by, it's, it's not always the change that you may be hoped for. But change when uh, something that is at stake is as important and fundamental as this is inevitable. This is a fight which, no matter how daunting it may seem, uh, it, it is there to be won. And uh, one of the most important things we can do in order to win that fight is to get our own government shifted to a position of warm rhetoric to significant actions. So I think that's uh, as much. I must have had my five minutes by now. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions or uh, any comments from, from uh, the audience. Thank you very much indeed, Alistair. Re really grateful for, for that uh, contribution. Um, we will go to questions uh, shortly, and, and there are a few that have come in on the chat. But before we do so, um, I'm very glad to see that we've been joined by uh, our final speaker on the panel, um, my good friend Miriam Lexman, uh, member of the European Parliament uh, from Slovakia. Um, Miriam, thank you so much for making time to join us. I know it's been a very uh, busy uh, uh, day uh, in the European Parliament for you. Um, just to introduce Miriam very briefly, and then uh, Miriam, we'll ask you to to uh, just speak, perhaps for for about five minutes, and then and then uh, we'll go to some questions. Um, Miriam was elected to the European Parliament uh, at last year. Um, she serves on the Parliament's uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs, but she's also together with um, Reinhard Butikoff, a, um, uh, a German member of the European Parliament, has launched. Uh, uh, an EU Hong Kong uh, group um, in the European Parliament. Um, she's also a co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China in the EU. Uh, and Miriam visited Hong Kong uh, last year um, as part of an election observation mission and has been a, a really true friend to Hong Kong ever since, uh, um, particularly in the European Parliament. So Miriam, thank you for joining us and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this very timely, timely discussion. Uh, I'm sorry I was late. I really was intending to be here on time, but the problem was that we had a negotiation about the report on Belarus and the worsening situation there and the lack of, I would say, lack of support of international communities, including EU, to the people of Belarus who are fighting on a daily basis. Unfortunately, the lack of support also we can see in terms of Hong Kong, China and, and any other corner of the world where people are facing brutal regimes. So, sorry for being late and just few thoughts on the Magnitsky Act and the Global Human Rights uh, Act the EU is, uh, is uh, pr uh, preparing. I would maybe kind of put it in a, in a perspective of a person who comes from a ex-communist country, Slovakia, and maybe understands the, the coercive and malign power these countries have, especially in the global world. When, one, one was, when I was a child and my uncles and, and parents to, to a certain extent were dissidents, uh, for, we kind of understand how much it, uh, it was when a foreign country from a democratic part of the world was giving support to the democratic opposition in my country, but we also understood how what kind of negative impact it had when a democratic country from abroad had the economic exchange and trade deals with my country or the Soviet Union or other countries of the, of the ex-Soviet bloc. And uh, in the 90s, when I started to be involved in international civil society organizations, I kind of did not understand that why we are all so open to, to uh, uh, kind of trade with countries which were not yet sure if they are on a democratic track. 
After a while, we realized that, for example, Russia is uh, maybe had a window of opportunity to to turn to as a democratic country, but the window was very small and did not uh, materialize in a reality. But nevertheless, we were continuing our economic and trade uh, cooperation with Russia at the very beginning, believing that through exchange and through trade deals and through exchange of people and and people to people contact and business to business contact, we will be able to influence these regimes and bring our values to those regimes. I think we have realized at a certain point that this doesn't work. And contrary to that, these regimes started to influence and undermine our own democracies through their corrupting practices, through their uh, media practices and disinformation. They started clearly even manipulate our own citizens and supporting, giving support to different uh, uh, populists or far left, far right or, or anti-democratic, anti-systemic uh, groups. And now we have woken up into the global world where we are having, a, a, we are economically dependent from many totalitarian regimes. And these regimes on top of it are undermining our, our democracy. I think Magnitsky Act is one of the clear and right answer to this, because if we would not have the Magnitsky Act and the acts, Magnitsky Act in other countries, we will be co-responsible for the human rights breaches and we will be complicit of the totalitarian regimes worldwide. This is the only thing uh, through which we can be able to a certain extent to, to break our complicity with these totalitarian regimes. And that's why I believe it's absolutely vital and morally important issue, because I understand as a politician, we cannot say that we cut all trade deals with China from one day to another. We cut all trade deals uh, with Russia from one day to another. Unfortunately, in this global world, it's Im impossible. And through Magnitsky Act, we are able to slowly build a space which will be through which our cooperation with those countries will be more moral and that's why i believe that this is the only way which will hopefully will open a bigger and bigger space for our activities now i mean in terms of china for example we are talking about uh, due diligence we are talking about uh, not allowing companies trading in our democratic part of the world who are involved in human rights breaches and, and, and uh, forced labor in, in China and other parts of the world. So I think this is something absolutely important. What I, I regret is that the European version, which is after so many years still only in making, and I'm really desperate that, that, that there, is, there is not enough of pressure on the Commission to finalize. I mean, now we, we are hoping to have already the, the draft by the end of this year, but it's far too late. Unfortunately, this draft is not including um, uh, or, or is not including the part on, on sanctioning uh, individuals or, or, or companies because of corruption. I think Bill knows far more about this because he was fighting very strongly that it would. But on the other hand, I hope that the European Union will follow very quickly with another uh, act which will include corruption as well. On the other hand, now we are already making pressure on, on the Commission that the sanctions imposed on different countries are are including corruption to certain certain extent. Of course, I mean, a new bill which will clearly include all scale of corruption practices will, will be very helpful, but unfortunately the EU is too late with that. So I will leave it here, maybe. Thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, that's um, really helpful. We, we have um, uh, just under 10 minutes left uh, before we're due to conclude. So I'm going to try to squeeze in um, as many questions as I can, but realistically only one or two that have come in through the chat. Um, and the first question that I'd like to ask, maybe not the whole panel for the sake of time, but anyone, uh, a few of you who, who would like to comment on this, um, what is your view of the steps taken by the United States to enact the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which ensures that secondary sanctions uh, are applied uh, against financial institutions 
um, which which are affiliated to those on the Magnitsky register. Could could similar sanctions be uh, be adopted by other countries? Who would like to uh... pick that up? And it comes to what I was saying about the interface between law and politics. Um, your question is the entry obviously could, and it, the more countries that were to take this approach, the better it would be. But it requires political commitment to do that, and that's what's lacking at the moment. Mm. And I Maybe I could jump in here too uh, as a uh, North American <laughs> from Canada, but you know, I, I, you know, in Canada, we do also have the Special Economic Measures Act, uh, which provides the ability to do those sectoral sanctions and to target entities. And so uh, the Americans are showing showing leadership on this. Uh, there's no doubt that that Canada, UK, and others could be following along the same path. You know, uh, the one interesting comment that that Miriam made talking about why she was late because we're dealing with the Belarusian uh, situation. Uh, you know, UK and Canada together sanctioned the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. So if we could work in concert to target a, a, a leader like Lukashenko, who's been using brutality to crack down again on peaceful protesters, as we're seeing in Hong Kong, then again, why aren't we not sanctioning Carrie Lam? Any of our other speakers like to add anything to that? I would only add that the EU uh, in the second round has also included Lukashenko on the sanctions list, and I was very pleased that we managed to 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 do that. And I completely agree that we should be more efficient in uh, sanctioning the top uh, orchestrators of the of the regimes. Thank you. Um, there's a there's a very good uh, couple of questions that I'm going to combine here. Um, I, other than uh, financial sanctions, um, uh, there, there are uh, some senior uh, Hong Kong officials um, who have uh, British uh, citizenship. In some cases, they're expat uh, Brits, particularly in the police uh, force. Um, in other cases, they, they may be um, BNO uh, holders, um, and that may apply perhaps in, in Canada as well. Um, is there something that could be done in that regard, and, and just to add to that, specifically in regard to British expat police who are responsible for complicit in police brutality, um, uh, what could be done to, uh, to hold them uh, to account? Yeah, maybe, maybe I could answer that uh, question first. Um, I think uh, many of you may have heard about uh, an in initiative that uh, is carried out by uh, Luke from Hong Kong Watch and I and the others that we are we have crowdfunded um, to pursue uh, private prosecutions on these expats in Hong Kong, which uh, they are allegedly committed in uh, torture crime, which we have jurisdiction to tackle it in UK courts. Uh, by doing so, we may uh, be able to hold them accountable uh, of their human rights violation in Hong Kong and all those police brutality. And this is, of course, one, one front that we are pursuing. And on the other, I think um, in the Municipiat, uh, there are entry barring, uh, asset frozen, a lot of uh, different functions serves as a uh, similar to um, blocking is uh, entrance and uh, maybe possibly uh, has it ha have any effects of like um, leaving the door shut for them. So I guess uh, this is also serves uh, the purpose of targeting uh, whether they they they, they can uh, and they can live freely in this country. <laughs> one other one other thing I should say here on this subject is that this is the beauty of having the Magnitsky Act in so many countries. So if a British if the British can't deny entry um, to a person who's got a British passport. Um, uh, but, but the Canadians can sanction him, uh, the, the Americans can sanction him, the EU can sanction him, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania can sanction him, and um, uh, you end up on a, on a bunch of country sanctions lists, and you know that's um, it's not a good thing. Um, and and so that that is the beauty of of having this um, be a cross country. And and I'm hoping I'm hoping that that. And the Magnitsky Act is still in its infancy in terms of legislation. The legislation varies from country to country, but I'm hoping that that 
uh, as time goes on, countries uh, work together, they harmonize the legislation and they apply it um, in, uh, and, and this can't ever be a United Nations type of thing because you end up with all this crazy United Nations, you know, Saudi Arabia being on the Human Rights Council type of stuff. But this can be a coalition of the willing where, where um, uh, countries work together. And I, and I know that, that, um, that, that, that um, uh, in, the, in the British government and in, in the U.S. government and the Canadian government, they have a, a strong interest in doing that. And so I think as time goes on, we'll, we'll, we'll find that um, it, it doesn't matter where you're, you're from. If you've done something bad, you'll end up on, on the list. Mm. Thank maybe, you. maybe one way of non-financial sanction uh, is uh, to not let the, these people, but of course, I mean, if they are not allowed to the countries, they cannot even access our universities. But one thing which I think is quite efficient is also to close the universities, our Western universities, to the children of the perpetrators of the regime. I know that children are not morally responsible for their parents, but on the other hand, this is, I mean, we are not depriving them from education. They can get education in the country where their parents are, are ruling. And if they are, disagree with it, they should kind of make pressure on their own parents to change the regime that they can then study abroad. So in a way, I mean, it was, uh, it was question, put in question that, that they should not be morally responsible for the parents. But I think to this extent that we ban our university to them, it's, it's still morally uh, expli explicable. There, there's one other point um, to, to add to that, which is that, ch yes, children are morally responsible for the acts of their parents, but if children receive money from their parents who are morally responsible, then they, then they should absolutely be targeted in the same way as their parents. And, and that's that's how the laws are written. So it captures those people if they've, it, unless they're financially independent from their parents, if they're receiving financial support from those parents who are sanctioned, then, then they're absolutely um, exposed to the same, the same degree as, as their parents. Absolutely. Um, let me just say at this point um, that I know uh, Nathan has to leave us for another uh, appointment and we, we're coming to the end uh, anyway. Um, Nathan, if you need to leave right now, a huge thank you to you for joining us um, and wonderful to have you with us. Um, and James and Alistair, I don't know if you would like to have the last word on this question or, or any other remarks. No. Uh, I mean, look, it's, just, it, 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 it's like playing a game of whack-a-ball. And the beauty of Magnitsky sanctions is that they are all within the sovereign control of each nation, but they really only work if you get the broad possible range of countries uh, implementing them. Hmm. Absolutely right. Um, well, um, at this point, uh, we, we are out of time. I know um, uh, probably all our speakers have other things to, to go on to um, in this wor world of uh, Zoom or online uh, uh, meetings. Um, so I just want to say firstly a huge thank you to, um, to all of our speakers, to Bill Browder, to Alistair Carmichael, um, to James Bazan, to Nathan who's now left us, and uh, to Miriam. Um, thank you so much everybody who uh, joined us and participated in, in this. Um, and just just to leave you with this thought, really echoing what Alistair uh, has said, that um, our uh, efforts in Hong Kong Watch are very much uh, global, um, and we're focused on trying to uh, encourage the free world to stand together uh, and to have uh, coordinated, uh, global, targeted uh, sanctions uh, on Hong Kong. Um, and. I think we've we've seen the beginnings of um, that kind of alliance uh, with the Five Eyes making a very strong statement, um, with other democratic countries stepping up their efforts, and now we need to build on that to uh, to encourage them to take this forward in the form of, of targeted Magnitsky sanctions. So we'll go on campaigning and advocating, um, but uh, a very big thank you to all our speakers and to everyone uh, who's joined us, and uh, we will um, see you again with another event um, before too long. Thank you all very much.